All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on evolution with a focus on the hominid fossil record. This debate is between Kent Hoven and James W. This is a continuation of our 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge series. We have now done roughly 30 of these uh, debates so far with many more to come. If you are not yet subscribed to this channel, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. As you know, we strongly believe in critical thinking, which is exactly why we host so many debates on a variety of important topics. Gentlemen, James W. and Dr. Dino, thank you so much for being here. And before we get into any opening statements, let's kind of break the ice, get to know you gentlemen a little bit. Uh, James W., why don't we start with you? Thanks for being here. A little bit about yourself, a little bit about your channel. Thanks, Donnie. So I co-host a channel with the wonderful Amy Newman. We do several podcasts, usually each week, talking about the hard hitting issues of the day, like uh, issues to do with religion, conspiracy theories, little politics. But we try to keep it fun. We invite people to come on, tell us what they believe and why. And uh, I am a uh, atheist. I am a counter apologist and I uh, used to be a Christian, but until about 2014, when I gave my life over to evidence and reason, and I became an atheist, and I'd like for you guys to make that journey with me today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much there, James W., for your introduction. And um, James, I'm not sure. It, we can hear you good, but there's a little bit of uh, kind of background noise. It might be from your... Um, I'm in a compound here. I'll try to speak as loud as I can. No worries, no worries, no worries. You're coming in okay. So, okay, uh, Kent, Kent, good to have you back as well. Uh, how you been? A little bit about yourself. Oh, God is good. Some of God's kids drive me crazy, but God is good. Uh, we, I'm in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years. Been a, taught high school science and math 15 years, and I defend the Bible as being scientifically true. I think God made everything in six days. That's the only way to work. Symbiotic relationships by the millions are out there that aren't going to work with evolution. I think evolution is the dumbest religion in the world. It's not, it's not a science. It's a religion. People believe in it. And I'm going to get James W. converted back. Well, at least converted over tonight. We'll try anyway. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Kent, for that intro. I do have the relevant links to both uh, Dr. Dino and James W. in the description box for people to check out. Okay. So tonight's topic, again, is the hominid fossil record. And uh, it's going to be, you know, kind of an informal debate, what we've typically been doing. We're going to have James start us off. He's going to give roughly 12 or 13 minutes. He's going to give us a breakdown of the hominid fossil record, why he believes that's evidence for evolution. Then we'll give Kent equal time to respond, 12, 13 minutes. And then we're just going to jump into a free-flowing discussion. So we're going to take one, one point or one topic at a time that has been brought up in the openings. And we're going to make sure that we uh, you know, do our best to discuss them all. And then we'll have a five-minute concluding statement where the debaters can wrap up their points and thoughts. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We're going to have an audience Q&A. Just please make sure you're tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss them. Okay, James, we're going to get right into it. I'm going to hand it over to you whenever you're ready. 12 to 13 minutes. The floor is yours. All right. Hey, everybody. Just so you guys know, we'll be doing an after show on the Amy Newman channel after this. So feel free to come on over. We'll have open mic so anybody can come on. Tell us what you think. Tell, us, tell me if I'm right, wrong but we'll have a good time Let me see. okay to begin evolution makes one specific claim and that is that life reproduces itself and is in a constant state of change genetic mutations acted on by the environment what we call natural selection produce macroscopic changes in organisms over time these changes typically take a very long time to accumulate to anything noticeable. Now, predictions. Based on what we know, we can predict a few things. We can predict that anatomically modern humans will be found to be in the most recent layers. We can predict that beyond that time range of modern humans, we will see forms of life that are similar to modern humans, yet distinctly different. And the further back in time we look, we'll see a trend 
of these animals appearing less and less like modern humans and more like the classical definition of an ape, which by the way, we are apes. We are apes, we're not monkeys, but we are apes. So first things first, so we gotta go back 65 million years when the asteroid knocked out the dinosaurs, hit the Gulf of Mexico, leaving a brave new world for our small shrew-like mammalian ancestor to lift its head out of its burrows and conquer. Eventually Eurasia separated from the Americas New and old world monkeys were separated by this new continent. Australia split from Antarctica and were there of all places. The marsupials won out over the mammals. We saw gigantic kangaroos and wombats there. Whereas in the Americas, uh, aside from the opossum, the, wom the uh, marsupials didn't too good, do too great. Then 40 million years ago, we had India smash into the Asian continent, producing the Himalayan mountains. And as Atheist Jr. pointed out, this is part of science. Mountain formation does happen. And we know, even though we're not sitting there watching it, it is a part of science. But the real, the real fun starts to happen in Africa about 30 million years ago when apes diverged from old world monkeys. And then about 7 million years ago when the human line diverged from that of our, our common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos, by the way, created a separate primate line. All the primates, though, have large brains compared to their body size, binocular front-facing eyes, grasping hands, and social hierarchies. Now, humans and chimps, as we know, share about 98.4% of our DNA. We're both territorial, and we're both capable of gratuitous violence, that is, violence for its own sake without real purpose. Our common ancestor with chimps, though, was much more suited for forest life, using the trees to keep safe due to environmental factors, forests in Africa becoming fewer and fewer and more grasslands and savannas opening up. Bipedalism began to be selected for by the environment. It drove our ancestors out of the trees into the savannas and allowed them to survive. By the time the Australopithecines came on the scene, the move was complete. Bipedalism had won out. So we're going to start off, we're going to introduce Kent to the homos. We're going to start with Homo habilis. Larger brain than the Australopithecines, but very, very primitive tools by comparison. Moving on, we have Homo ergaster with an even larger brain size than that of habilis. More intelligent, larger range in where it lived, and it even probably started to use fire. It began to create much better tools and began to eventually engage in collective learning. That's passing down knowledge from one person to the next. And we have Homo antecessor and Homo heidelbergensis and Homo neanderthalus. They used fire systematically for the first time. They made bladed tools, spears, tools made out of different items like wood and stone. Neanderthals moved into cooler climates, necessitating the development of clothing and modern humans. That's us. We came on the scene around 250,000 years ago. So how do we know we have a common ancestor with chimps? Well, we have good evidence that humans share a common ancestor with chimps, as uh, Mark Reed so wonderfully and elegantly pointed out in the previous debate. Uh, human number two chromosome is a fusion of two chromosomes found in other cities. The chimpanzee chromosome, you can tell right where it fused, and the existence of numerous endogenous retroviruses prove beyond a reasonable doubt that humans share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Sorry, not sorry, that's just the truth. And uh, Kent didn't want to touch that last debate with a 15-foot whale phallus, but... Uh, uh, it is, it is the truth. And the fossil record, it tells us a story. And it's a very different story than the one my opponent is peddling. He doesn't want you to connect the dots. He doesn't want you to understand what's going on here. That's his job, to muddy the waters and make this as confusing as possible so you won't see the writing that is written on the wall. I ask you to resist his obfuscation. There are four lights. Modern humans. We have Homo sapiens originating perhaps in Africa as far back as 300,000 years ago. Intelligent tool makers, developed advanced language, a global range. That's us. We know what we are. We don't really have to spend a lot of time on that. Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalus, lived in Eurasia from about 400,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. 
we sequenced their DNA in 2008. Yeah, we have Neanderthal DNA. That's how we know that modern humans have a small amount of Neanderthal DNA as part of our genome. Now, it was found to be about 99.7% similar to modern humans. So modern humans, we all share about 99.463, 99.9% of our DNA. So the Neanderthals were pretty close. They were pretty close, but they are distinctly different. They are not modern humans. They did make advanced tools, but not as advanced as Homo sapiens were doing. In fact, they remained hunter-gatherers after modern humans had developed agriculture and began domesticating animals. They had a shorter, stockier body size, larger brains, receding forehead, prominent brow ridge. We all know all about that. We have Homo heidelbergensis, lived between 700 and 200,000 years ago, originally thought to be an erectus, Homo erectus subspecies, but it has been now classified as its own species. Um, possibly our most common ancestor between modern humans and Homo neanderthalus. Lived in Euro Europe and possibly Asia and Africa. First discovered in 1907, but since then there have been numerous examples found. They had a large brain case with a flatter face than modern humans. The first species to truly adapt in colder climates and build self shelters to live in. They're known for the ability to hunt large animals and what had not been seen in human species before. Another homo, Homo rudolfensis, Kent, lived 1.9 to 1.8 million years ago in Africa, discovered Kenya 1972, a large, nearly complete skull. We had a right lower femur, a full upper femur, and a complete left femur. Numerous other examples have been found. We have face, we have jawbones found in 2012. Homo rudolfensis are different from other homo species, having a longer face and... Uh, slightly different dental structure than modern humans or their ancestors. Homo erectus, the big one. Homo erectus, upright man, emerged about 2 million years ago in Asia, Africa, and Europe. They didn't go extinct until about 100,000 years ago. Human-like body proportions, upright stance, protruding brow ridge, no real chin, and larger faces. We have found numerous examples of them all over the world due to how long they were around they varied widely in size and uh, dispersion because they were all over the world. Homo habilis, handyman, 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago. Only found a few of these guys, so they're one of the less complete lineages. Homo habilis possessed some ape-like features, longer arms, and a more ape-like face. They had a larger brain case, 550 to 687 centimeters compared to animals that lived before them but a smaller face and smaller teeth, Homo florensis. These are the hobbits that were found in an island off of, uh, I believe, Indonesia. Key fossils found in 2003. They were about 3.5 feet tall, had a tiny brain. They made stone tools. They hunted small elephants and large rodents, only in this one place in the world because they evolved there. And they weren't specially created. Now, this is the one that keeps our gracious host up late at night. This is the one that he really uh, gives him great concern. And this is Australopithecus sediba, lived 2,000, 2 million years ago, coexisted with both Erectus and Ergaster, possibly a transition between Australopithecines and the genus Homo. Partial juvenile and a complete adult specimens have been found. Combination of primitive traits derived from Sediba shows part way of a transition between arboreality, being in the trees, and bipedality, walking on the ground. But the legs and feet were previously, they pointed to a different way of locomotion that was previously not well understood before that. With each step, they turned their foot inward and its weight shifted to the outer edge of the foot. This odd way of striding. Uh, was a new find for human evolution, but that's what it is. We find bones in the dirt and we make logical conclusions about them. We don't try to pretend that it's a mixture of human and ape fossils because it's just too transitional. And this is the other one that really, well, this is not the one that gives them that hard of a time. Australopithecus africanus, 3.67 to 2 million years ago, discovered 1924 with a 90% intact specimen lived in Africa, not new, known to use stone tools, bipedal. Now, this is the one that really also gives them a hard time. Australopithecus afarensis lucy, 
3.85, 2.95 million years ago, lived in Africa, had human and ape-like characteristics, had a small, much smaller brain case than modern humans, about one third the size. And uh, it was bipedal. Lucy walked upright. We can tell that from the shape of the pelvis, the leg bones, the knees. There are just several things, the way the spine is shaped. We know that she walked upright. And when found, this was one of the best examples of that link, bridging that link between our tree climbing ancestors and our bipedal ancestors. And they have found more than 300 of these all over Africa, over 300 found. And uh, so uh, Kent's main argument, his main shtick, is that he is incredulous that these changes can add up over time. How does this happen? He doesn't get it. How can you have small changes over time leading to very large changes? Well, say Lucy lived about 3.2 million years ago, and we can estimate conservatively there have been about 128,000 generations from Lucy to today. Put that into scale, New York and Los Angeles are about 2779 miles apart or 14.7 million feet. If you made 128,000 stops along the way, you would be stopping every 114 feet, traveling at a modest 40 miles an hour. You'd be stopping about every two seconds. Okay, this is a very gradual shift from Lucy to today. And Kent is fine. He's fine with shifts like... Uh, horses and zebras. He's fine with two cats coming off the ark and getting tigers, lions, jaguars, cougars, all in a matter of 100 years. But he's incredulous that Lucy, over 3.2 million years, could evolve 15 seconds. into modern humans. It's an entirely reasonable position. It's the story the fossil record tells us. It's reality, whether you like it or not. Thank you. All right. Thank you, James. Uh, 13 minutes on the dot. So we are going to now hand it to Kent. Kent, we'll give you 13 minutes and whatever is not uh, addressed can be discussed during the open discussion. So we'll have some fun. Kent, uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Oh, oh, all right. Let's see. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, James, for that. Uh, everything he shared tonight was speculation. None of this has been observed. And no fossil would count as evidence for anything in a court of law. You don't know those bones they found had any kids. You know that. It's a, it's a bone in the dirt. It's dead. No animal today does what he says. What they do is they draw lines on paper. Just imagine humans and apes have a common ancestor. Oh, and a whale. There's a common ancestor, an amoeba. I think we need to start, James, with the definition of science. Science comes from the Latin word scientia. What do we know? It means knowledge. We know cows produce cows, and apes produce apes, and monkeys produce monkeys, and humans produce humans. That we know. We do not know that they're related. You imagine that, okay? Any system of knowledge concerned with the physical world and its phenomena that entails unbiased observations, systematic experimentation. Okay, do all the observation and experimentation you want. You know, I used to raise monkeys, my brother and I, in Illinois, uh, a squirrel monkey, spider monkeys, and they always produce baby monkeys. No exceptions, none, never. Science, knowledge gained from using observation and experiments to describe and explain the world around us, okay? Science, uh, knowledge gained from using observations and experiments. All observation says monkeys produce monkeys, apes produce apes. They don't produce humans ever, never been observed. Okay, here's the way science works. Make an observation, develop an idea about why it happens, think of experiments to test it, predict what will happen, observe what actually happens, and modify the ideas if the prediction is wrong. Okay, I predict, my observation is cows always produce cows. I have a theory that maybe it's genetic. That's all they can produce is cows. Okay, that's my theory. Experiments to test the ideas. Well, let's see, keep breeding them, all right? Babies will be cows. That's what I predict every time. We got, what, two or three of our cows are pregnant up there. I predict I have a baby and it'll be a cow. I bet five bucks on that. They're always cows, okay? Observe what actually happens. And number six, modify the ideas if their predictions are wrong. Nope, it seems to always work. No need to modify the theory. Cows produce cows. God said they will bring forth after their kind. It's all we've ever seen. No human on the planet has ever in history seen anything other than that. 
I believe apes always produce baby apes. Same thing. Let's see. Must be genetic. Keep, let, keep letting them breed. Babies are going to be apes, and they're always apes, and it seems to work. See, everything he shared tonight is speculation. It is not science. Science is what we know, observe, and study, and test. We know apes produce apes, monkeys produce monkeys. We do not know anything about this old world, new world splitting, and we don't know anything about India crashing into the Himalaya mountains. We know India is touching, and Himalaya mountains are certainly pushed up. Well, five miles on an 8,000-mile Earth is not a whole lot, but, yeah, you couldn't even feel it on a scale at this scale. But <clears throat> we don't know that it happened from India crashing into anything. You can believe that if you'd like. See, science is what we can observe, study, and test, okay? No one has ever seen an ape produce a non-ape. These are just simply lines on paper. What is science? Knowledge. Definition of science. Systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the world. So he's going to say, you'll hear him say already, already said about seven times tonight, it takes millions or billions of years. You have to add time. I do this often because it's so effective. The pacifier that keeps the evolutionists from crying is time. Oh, how could this happen? Oh, give me time. That doesn't work. Give me more time. No, 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 no. As if that's going to help. First of all, that takes it outside the realm of science. You don't observe it. You don't test it. You can't experiment with it. It's a belief. It's a religion. You believe in that, which is fine. Believe what you want. But stop calling it science and stop making all the kids learn that nonsense in school. Let's see. Religions also attempt to understand and explain the world. I agree. But religion is not considered a science. This is somebody's definition on BB, let's see, EBC. Okay, well, evolution's a religion. It's not a science. We never observe any of this. You imagine, everything has a common ancestor. Oh, how would you define science? Science is knowledge. Knowledge attained through study or practice. A system of acquiring knowledge. System uses observation, experimentation, to describe and explain natural phenomena. I think it's natural phenomena that cows always produce cows and birds always produce birds, and there are simply no exceptions to that. The term science refers to the organized body of knowledge people have gained using that system. Mm -hmm. So, questions. Do you agree with this standard definition of science, James, that knowledge man has accumulated by observation, experimentation, and testing? You can Google it for yourself. This is the standard definition of science thousands and thousands of places on the internet. That's science. How would you define the word evolution? How do you define the word species? You're claiming that X number million years ago something happened, one changed into another kind. That's not science, that's my point. What's the best evidence you know of for any plant or animal turning into a different kind? Not a fossil you found in the dirt. Why can't they do it today? Why don't we see some apes today halfway toward human? This is not happening. Evolution, the process by which different kinds of organ, living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. Well, that's how they think it happened. See, it's not observable. It's how they are thought to have developed. Ah, okay. The gradual development of something, especially, this is more like the languages evolving, et cetera. Okay, what's the best definition of evolution? A process of gradual change that takes place over many generations during which species of animals, plants, or insects slowly change some of their physical characteristics. Well, now, I think probably the horses have uh, changed to where we now have a couple hundred different varieties of horses. Some can run faster, some can jump higher, some are shorter, some are taller, some can stand the heat better. They're still horses. Maybe zebras are in there too, could be. Still got hooves, four hooves, tail on the back, nose on the front, looks like a horse, four wheel drive, okay? What is the modern definition of evolution? Hmm from nature. We define evolution as understood in, to modern biology as it applies to ecology. Evolution is defined as the change in the inherited traits of a population of organisms through successive generations. I think they change, but I think the changes are limited. I use the illustration on my tours I give here. They have rodeos in Texas where they ride cows and teach them to jump. And they see who can jump their cow the highest. Jump, so they have a, like a high, high jump or pole vault, okay? I predict there is a limit to how high cows can jump. Have they reached that limit? I don't know. I don't know what the record is. Let's say the four foot. You got your cow to jump four foot. Maybe next year somebody will go four foot and a half inch. Okay. The record may be broken, but 
there is a limit. The cow will never jump over the moon. There's a limit. Have they reached it? I don't know. Have we, have we reached the speed limit for humans to run the 100 yard dash? If somebody breaks the record, it'll be by a hundredth of a second. I think it's like nine seconds for the 100 yard dash or something like that. Okay. Well, why don't somebody run it in one second? There's a limit. You guys refuse to understand real science. Evolution, the theory of evolution, violates the obvious observation. There are limits to the changes. You want to turn an amoeba to a whale or a human over billions and billions of years. That's not observable. Definition of evolution. Des Stephen Gould. Descent with modification from pre-existing species. I agree. They're modified, but they're limited how far they can modify. 167 species of ducks now. Might have had a common ancestor called a duck. Cumulative inherited change in a population of organisms through time, leading to the appearance of new forms. Yeah, new varieties of the same thing. Evolution, a process of continuous branching and diversification of common trunks. This pattern of irreversible, irreversible separation, why would it be reversible, Stephen? Uh, gives life's history as based, uh, basic directional, directionality. This is imagination. Evolution, I do this all the time. We've got four minutes left. There are six different meanings to the word. Cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. You guys want to claim it came from a big bang where a dot of near nothing exploded. This is not only not science, it's real stupid. You couldn't squeeze a glass of water into a dot smaller than a period on a page. You certainly couldn't squeeze the whole Pacific Ocean in there. It's moronic to believe the whole universe was squeezed into a dot. Not only the matter, but the energy was all in that dot. All the heat from all the stars in the history of the universe was in that dot. That's a pretty high temperature dot. Yeah. Let's see. Big Bang Theory. That's what they teach. It violates all the laws of thermodynamics. We'll cover that some other time. The second meaning of the word evolution is chemical evolution. You have to have the Big Bang supposedly produced hydrogen and maybe helium and some lithium. Well, how do you get all these elements? Helium and maybe some lithium? Okay. You can't fuse past iron. How do you get uranium, platinum, lead? I want to get, how do you get that from Big Bang? It can't be done. And I cover in my seminar the impossibility of chemical evolution. Then we have what's called, uh, let's see. Get, sorry, I should have put a hyperlink in here to pass up through all this. But you can watch my videotape number one. I'm sure you've watched it before and probably loved it, didn't you, James? Let's see. Chemical evolution. It's, it's a, it's, it is a thing. You can Google it on the Internet. Chemical evolution, chemical evolution. It, it doesn't happen. Number three is stars have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen a star form. We've never seen one star form. They see a couple spots get brighter and assume a star is forming. That's not science. It's a religion. You believe that. Organic evolution. Where did life come from? You want to start with a monkey and turn it to a human, which I think is also impossible. Well, you think the monkey came from an amoeba over millions of years? That's number four. Is uh, oh, oh, Number four, organic evolution, getting life started. Macro is changing from one kind to another. Nobody's ever seen that. No farmer in the history of the world in the laboratory or not, has ever seen any cow produce a non-cow or a monkey produce a non-monkey. Ask the folks at any zoo where they raise them. Do they ever produce anything other than their same kind? And you're going to say, well, it takes millions of years. Then it's not science. It's outside the realm of science. You can't observe it. Macroevolution is dreaming, okay? Micro, variations within the kind. Now, that one I agree with. But shouldn't call it microevolution. It's just a variation. God said they'll bring forth after their kind. That's all they've done. And you want to keep talking about transitional fossils. James, no fossil counts as evidence. No fossil could be transitional. You couldn't prove it had any kids. All you could prove is it died. You couldn't prove it had kids different from itself. No animal today can produce kids other than their kind. Why should we believe the bones in the dirt can do something that no animal today can do? You want people to believe that the bones were capable of doing something we never see any animal today capable of doing, producing something other than its kind. It just is not science. Transitional fossils help scientists bridge gaps in the tree of life. All populations are organisms in transition. This is dumb. Their variations are limited. The cow will never jump over the moon. A human's never going to run the 100-yard dash in one second. Never. Okay, there's a limit. So I think evolution is baloney. It's not science. It's the dumbest religion ever invented. And if you want to believe in it, that's fine. But don't call it science and don't make it mandatory teaching in all the schools. And certainly don't base your government 
on that dumb theory, which is what communism is based on. That, that we'll cover that on video number uh, five of my series, The Dangers of Evolution. So anyway, uh, I'll cover your other stuff. You mentioned when you get back and back and forth, the fossil record, the new uh, and old world monkeys. You are apes. You said we are apes. You speak for yourself, James. I'm not. Never was. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kent and uh, James. Both uh, opening statements between uh, 12 and 13 minutes. Let me restart the timer. We've got uh, a good amount of points to discuss. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Again, the topic is the hominid fossil record, so we'll do our best to stick to the topic. James, what we'll do is hand it to you, and we will allow you to pick the first point, question, argument, however you want to proceed. Go ahead. Oh, James, I think you have to unmute yourself. I want to talk about a few of the things that Kent brought up. And first of all, I want to say, yes, I did get to watch um, videotape number one. I did like it. Um, I think it was unintentionally one of the greatest comedies I've ever seen. In fact, we reviewed it on the Amy Newman channel. And uh, you're going to be having a debate with her. You debated her on Brett Keane. I believe you're going to be debating her. So do your homework and get ready for that one, Kent. Um, but re guys, remember what I told you from before. He's trying to get you not to connect the dots. He's trying to obfuscate. He doesn't want you to read the writing on the wall. He's got his talking points. But that's really all he has. He doesn't want you to pay attention to the evidence. And uh, like I said before, definition of science. So humans thousands of years ago made observations of the information they had available to them. And they concluded that their world was round long before any human had ever been high enough off the ground to observe curvature. And that absolutely was science, what they were doing. They were making good use of the information they had available to them. And they came to the right conclusion. And when we figured, when we did go up, when we did sail around the world, we confirmed it absolutely to be the truth. Um, but we don't pretend we don't know something just because it conflicts with somebody's theology. And he loves to talk about fossils. We don't know if this particular fossil had a kid or not. Cows produce cows. Well, they do, Kent. But as you know, they produce slightly different cows. And these time, I know you, you don't like it, but these small variations over time do produce change. And that's what we see in the fossil record. We do the experiment. We look in the ground. We see things that are not like life today. The, the older the, that we look back, we see things that are less and less like life today. How's that work under his model? He doesn't know. He does, uh, According to his model, if the dates don't work and it was a global flood, everything should all just be mixed up and jumbled together with no rhyme or reason because the dating is unreliable. But that's not what the data shows. The data shows a gradual transition from modern humans back to apes what we would consider apes because we absolutely are apes and i'm calling you an ape kent because you are i'm not trying to insult you but uh you are it is what it is i i think a lot of yec wouldn't object to that they just say it's a human-made classification but uh we'll let kent go ahead and respond okay thank you sir evidence from fossils is what you're claiming is evidence for evolution um there could be no evidence from fossils. I covered this on video number four, lies in the textbooks. And I'm glad you had a good laugh about my video number one, about the age of the earth, because I know full well, if you take away time, I know what happens when you pull the pacifier out of the baby's mouth. I know what happens. They scream, ah, I want it back. If we take away time from you guys, you're going to scream. I fully understand. But there's lots of reasons why you cannot have billions of years. Article came out, was it today, Fox News. If Neptune's orbit changes one one hundredth of a percent, it's going to completely upset the solar system. There are so many fine-tuned things in our solar system and on the planet. It cannot be billions of years old. You can't have billions of years. Pacifier gone. Go ahead and cry about it in a minute. I know you will. Okay. Uh, let's see. You said, uh, I'm trying to get people to not connect the dots and obfuscating. James, this is what you guys do. The dots are obvious. There is no such thing as a fossil record. There are lots of fossils. Well, that's evidence of a flood. How many fossils are forming today? Animals die by the millions every day. None that we know of fossilize. It doesn't happen. It gets scattered by the coyotes and the buzzards and the ants, and it's gone. 
So the fact that there are fossils at all is indication of rapid burial, like the petrified clams I've got here. We have hundreds of them. Petrified clams in the closed position. You guys never address this. These things are found on top of Mount Everest. Tallest mountain in the world is covered in petrified closed clams, indicating it was buried quickly and buried alive. Noah's flood is the obvious explanation for having fossils at all. The fact that there's any sorting to the fossils has lots of other obvious explanations. Evidence for evolution. Fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. This is silly. This is propaganda. You don't look back in the fossil record. Fossils only exist in the present. We put our interpretation on them. When we went down to Grand Canyon in the helicopter, the guide said, we just went back 300 million years. I looked at my watch. It was the same date as it was when I was at the top. I didn't go back in time at all. This is pure baloney, okay? The fossils are not well sorted like the textbook says. Even uh, David Ropp, um, Science Magazine said, uh, one of the ironies of the creation evolution debate, creationists have accepted the mistaken notion the fossil record shows a detailed orderly progression. It does not. Name and age of the layer is determined by the fossils it contains. This poses something of a problem. We date the rocks by the fossils. How can we then date the fossils by the rocks? Niles Eldridge. Ah. There's ample evidence that the layers formed rapidly. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up. You guys claim the top layer is younger. Stop and think. Where's this material coming from? We flip this little thing over, and it makes 20 or 30 layers in minutes. Is the top layer younger? There is no such thing as a geologic column, James. There is no such thing. There are layers, no question. I taught her science 15 years. I've been to, let's see, a bunch of 37 countries, all 50 states. I've studied the canyons of the world, many of the big ones. Uh, there's no question there's canyons. There's no question there's layers. They're not different ages, and they all form from runoff from the flood or the lakes draining 50 years after the flood. Petrified trees standing up are proof running through all these layers. And Alabama's got a bunch of them up here at the coal mine north of me, running through all the different layers. The layers are not different ages. The fossils all formed in probably one year, Noah's flood. They're sorted based upon mobility, body density, intelligence, et cetera. They're not sorted based upon one turning to another. Plenty of time. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, James. All right. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, like I said, can't, he can't really argue with the fossil record. He can't really refute what it shows. He just has to get you to try to hand wave, not consider it, don't consider it because we don't know which particular fossil had kids. Well, we don't need to know which particular fossil had kids or not because we see we have many examples and we have a very good progression in terms of human evolution from humans today to animals that look similar to humans going back in time to where they look less like modern humans and more like what you would consider an ape to look like. And so he went through a lot of his uh, talking points and, uh, you know, he's got this magical flood he believes in that accounts for like all of geology. And I mean, we know the flood didn't happen. We know it couldn't have happened. There's so many problems with the flood, but it's all they, it's all they have. So I, I have to, I, I understand why they use it because they just don't have anything else. But, uh, I, I know Ken, he likes that. He has a good time poking fun at us about the time thing and the pacifier. And it's all in good fun. But, I mean, we do have the time. We do have it. it we've got it. I'm sorry. Uh, he wants to think he's only got 6,000 years. We don't. We've got 4.5 billion years on Earth. That's the reality of it. He went through, like, the fine-tuning argument and silly things like that that really don't have anything to do with evolution. Of course, he went through all his six types of evolution, which is... Not what we're here to debate. I would be happy to debate that some other time, but we're here today focusing on biological evolution, human evolution in particular. Um, we do have a fossil record. We do. We have we have lots of bones in the dirt, Kent. I don't know if you're aware of that. We have lots of bones in the dirt. And when we look at these bones and we make measurements and we look at the information we get from that, we see a story. And it's not the story that your book tells. Your book tells a very different story about all the animals poofing 
into their modern forms all at once. That's not what we see in the fossil record. But you have to understand that the people who wrote that book, they didn't know about any of this. They lived 4,000, 2,500 years ago where humans knew almost nothing about anything. So it's, of course, they would make mythology that get things very wrong, but we're not limited by that today. We can do better than what our ancestors did. We have information available to us. We have the internet. We have libraries. You don't have to be ignorant anymore. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, James. You keep mentioning fossil record over and over, and you say, we have a fossil record. We have I mean, you're determined to keep making this dogmatic statement. Listen to me. None of the fossils talk. None of them. They all represent something that died, okay? You cannot prove any of them had children. You cannot prove any of them are related to anything else today. You can believe that if you'd like. There is no fossil record. There are fossils, trillions of them. I know a lot about it. We have hundreds, maybe thousands in our museum here at Come Visit Dinosaur Adventure Land. There's no question there are fossils. And there might be a little bit of sorting to them, which is obvious would happen in a flood. During high, high tide, there's more pressure put on the material at the bottom. If there was a worldwide flood that drowned all this stuff, all the animals are buried in this mud. The lifting and squeezing of the sediment layers, just based on what's called liquefaction, as the pressure is relieved, the particles fly up, it's going to automatically sort the fossils, bird, mammal, reptile, amphibian. They're not always found like this, but there is sort of a general rule that birds are found in the similar layer to other birds. Well, during the flood lasting a year, the liquefaction, which can sink a building, you know, would do that. I think the fossils, if there's any sorting at all, is explained by habitat. The reason clams are found at the bottom is because clams are already at the bottom. That's where they live. Of course, they're the first ones buried. Nothing to do with evolution. Birds are found on top because birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. They got hollow feathers and hollow bones. When they do drown, they float. Maybe they're based on intelligence. Clams aren't too smart. Maybe the, any sorting is based upon mobility. Clams can't run very fast or based upon body density. I'm telling you, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are trillions of fossils, no question. But they don't talk. There's no record. You're making this up. This is imagination. You and SpongeBob ought to get a job together imagining all this wonderful stuff that happened. It's not science. You said uh, about the Earth round, like that's got something to do with this. I agree. The Earth's always been round. I, I never said anything other than that got nothing to do with evolution. Don't try to tie that in because that is science. That is not nothing to do with finding a bone in the dirt and claiming it's the ancestor of somebody today. Why don't we see any animals today doing what you claim happened? There are a lot of animals that have a very short generation time. Amoebas, eight hours. Grow up, get married, have kids, eight hours. You can get tens of thousands of generations of amoebas in one, one, a couple of human lifespans. Well, they're still producing amoebas, never anything else. You guys imagine evolution. You don't see it. We got 20 points on the table here, uh, Donnie. Um, and you said, I'm trying to make it as confusing as possible. No, absolutely not. Ask anybody who watches my material. I try to make things as simple as possible. There is no geologic column. It doesn't, ha it doesn't exist. These layers form rapidly. And you say the top layer. I've never had an evolutionist answer that. James, this is one question. You guys say the top layer is younger. Where did it come from? How can it possibly be younger? Please answer just that one. And before you do, James, let me just jump in real quick. So, so far we've had uh, 13 minute opening statements and we've now had about two rounds where you each had four minutes of uninterrupted time. So why don't we now, um, which I think we're about to do is, is go one topic, one point and have more of a free flowing dialogue. So James, you can answer that. We can go back and forth on that a bit. Then James, I know you brought up some specifics in your opening, like sure. um, Strolopithecine, Sediba. So, you know, why don't we go with that? James, go ahead. So Ken, well, Kent wants to know, he wants to know where the layers come from. And I, I think he has a pretty good, he taught high schools. He has his doctorate in education. He taught high school science for 15 years. I think he understands how sedimentation happens. I don't really think we need to go into that. We know that layers form and we know this happens over time. You see, years ago, when uh, all these Christian geologists like Charles Lyell, when they went out into the world, 
Bible in hand, and they thought they were going to prove geology, prove the Bible based on geology, but they found something very different. And when they found that, they took the opposite route that Kent takes. Kent tries to make reality fit his theology. They went the other route. They said, well, if there's a conflict, we throw out the man-made theology. We don't try to make reality fit that theology. And that's what he's doing. He's got these incongruent facts. He just wants to explain them away or pretend they don't count like the fossil record. And, uh, you know, we figured out Kent, that the earth had to be very old. It had to be very old. We knew that 100, 200 years ago. And we see animals today reproducing with variation. We know that's what happens today. Animals produce slightly different animals, still the same kind, but slightly different. And when we extrapolate that over the time that we know we have, we're going to have macroscopic changes. And that's what we see in the fossils. Call it a record. Don't call it a record. That's what we have to contend with. Okay. For the listening audience and for James, you did not answer my question. You said, oh, I hope it's geology. He knows where the, no, where is the top layer coming from? You're claiming the top layer is younger. Did it get moved from here to here and now became younger because it got reshuffled? How can any layer be a different age than any other layer? All the layers are either 6,000 or 6 trillion years old, whatever number you want to pick, but they're all the same. Did the top layer come from outer space? If I shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger? No. Okay. So don't just bypass the question saying, well, Hovind knows this kind of stuff. No, I want an answer. How can the layer be younger, James? One question. So answer it. So when we talk about the age of a layer, we're talking about when it, when it was deposited. We're not talking about when the molecules were created. We're talking about when that layer was deposited, when something in that layer was last exposed to the atmosphere to pick up free carbon from the atmosphere. That's what we're talking about. And we're not talking about when the molecules were created. If they were created probably in a, a supernova of a star 10 billion years ago or something like that. That's when they, they were created. They've changed form since then, though. Go ahead. Oh, Kent, I'm sorry. You're on mute. Go ahead if you want to restart. By your logic, if I shuffle this deck of cards, this one is now younger. Because no we're not game. talking about absolute age. We're talking about when a layer was deposited. That's all. We, we don't care when it was created. We care when it was deposited so that we know if a layer was deposited and there's an organism buried in that layer, we know that organism lived at the time the layer was deposited, right? It makes sense. Even you understand that. Well, you're saying I understand it. I'm asking you a very simple question. Where's this layer coming from? Does moving it from here to here, redepositing it, change the age of it? Is that what you're saying? Because it got not, moved from here to here, it's now a different age. Am I understanding you right? We're not talking again about absolute age. We're talking about when a layer was deposited. So that's how we can, we don't care. We care about wh when it was deposited. So we know if this was deposited at a certain time, organisms in that layer were around around that time right it, it makes sense Ken. you you understand it you're just trying to make it sound a lot more complicated than it needs to be no you're avoiding my question completely where did it come from the, if it came from earth to earth it's still the same age you're saying you don't know that depositing it doesn't change the age of it shuffling my cards doesn't change the age of the top one moving the dirt sure. from one section to another doesn't it has to be coming from outer space to be a different age, to be on top. And all these trees that are standing up, connecting all these layers, proves your geologic column is stupid. It doesn't happen. There is no geologic column. All the layers are the same age. Petrified trees standing up are found all over the world. Hundreds and thousands probably have been found petrified standing up. The layers aren't different ages, James. I'm sorry to pull the pacifier out, oh. but you can't have billions of years. The layers form quickly. Well, I mean, we, we've gone through these, the, your polystrate trees before, and we've talked about that, and we know that they're there, but that's really not what we're here to talk about today. We're really here to talk about human evolution and the fossil record, and I don't think you really have any objection to it. I don't think you really have any 
response to the to what it shows. You just think that we can't consider it because the bones don't talk. I mean, Australopithecus afarensis, this is a hominid-like ancestor that nobody has ever seen before. We don't have any descriptions of these animals in ancient culture or literature. Nobody's ever written about them. They look radically different from anything today, yet we find them in the fossil record. What do you think? Where's Lucy come from, Kent? What is Lucy? Lucy is a collection of bones put together by Donald Johansson, and he admitted it was at least two separate species that he mingled together, and now we know it's maybe more than that. Lucy is a fraud, a, whor a forgery, okay? But again, Lucy is about three feet tall when he got it fully mm -hmm. assembled. It's a type of monkey or ape. It's got nothing to do with humans, though there are humans today that are three feet tall. You don't know Lucy had any children. You certainly don't know you're related to Lucy or descended from Lucy. You imagine this stuff. It's well, imagination. Lucy is a type of ape, Kent. It, Lucy is a type of ape, but so are we, Kent. We're, we are apes. So, so of so course, Lucy, Lucy is a type of ape, Kent. And, yeah, we know at the time that there was a mistake made with, I believe it was a baboon bone that got mixed into Lucy. But who do you think solved that, Kent? The scientific community over the time found that mistake. They fixed it. They took it out of the textbooks just like they took Piltdown Man and Nebraska Man out of the textbook. We have no problem taking things that are wrong out of the textbook. You just think the whole thing is wrong. And, and that's not, not what we have, but we don't have just Lucy. We have numerous other examples of Australopithecus afarensis. You have to deal with it and tell us what it is. You can't just pretend it's a, a collection because we have much more complete fossils than Lucy. We have 80, 90% complete fossils of Australopithecus afarensis. Okay, I think we would probably both agree that there have been lots of different creatures in the history of humanity have gone extinct. Sure. There don't seem, don't seem to be any more of them alive around, okay? Somebody, they're gone. Somebody killed the last one or died, okay? Could it be, because there are like 40 different types of apes, baboons, chimpanzees, and monkeys. I forget how many different kinds of monkeys there are, a lot, okay? Humans. Okay, could it be that something has gone extinct and they found the bones of one? And now you wanna say it's the ancestor of us today. Well, we don't see any monkeys today producing humans or even coming well, close. The reason they there's similarity, no, there's similarity point, between us and humans, uh, between us and apes, because the same guy designed them. God designed us to do similar things, to walk, to talk, to carry things, to pick up things, to see, to hear. Of course, we got some similarities. I bet Chevy and Ford got some similarities, like four round tires and a steering wheel and an engine. Doesn't prove any relationship. It's a design. I think we are designed by an all wise designer. And somebody decided to draw these lines on paper. Oh, this way. And it's baloney. It's imagination. You don't know any of those are connected. None. You believe it. The cavemen, you think that's your grandpa? Okay. They're the world's most wanted cavemen. All of the ones that you mentioned, Nebraska man, finally taken out of the book after a long time of being in there. All they find for Nebraska man was one tooth. One tooth. Here's what they found. Our early hominids had a partially opposable big toes. All they found are the red bones. They made up the rest of it with the footprints. They made up the footprints and put a toe separation in there to look more like an ape's foot. The form of the foot was exactly the same as ours. And National Geographic said 42 years ago, uh, people who go barefoot all the time, their foot widens out, okay? We know uh, if the footprints weren't known to be so old, we would conclude they were a member of our own genus, Homo, from National History uh, Magazine 30 years ago. They've known this, but when they, made Lucy, they added a toe separation in there. They lied. They want you to believe you came from an ape. You didn't. I didn't. You might be an ape. I am not, okay? We, did, we didn't come from an ape. We, we are apes. But oh, speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. I am not, for the record. You talked about Lucy being an extinct prime, and absolutely, yeah. The Austria of the Pythocines went extinct, okay? But at some point, they diverged and humans, the Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, linked off of them. And it was a very, very gradual transition. I know you don't, I know you're incredulous to it. You don't think it can happen. But there's a lot of people that have been studying this for a really, really, really long time. 
and they know, and we have the fossil record, we have the date to these fossils. Like if what you're saying is true, right? There would be no rhyme or reason to any of these dates. You would just have random dates. You you wouldn't have a linear progression. You wouldn't have this trend from more human-like to less human-like. And, and by the way, we we see these trends also in the tools that they use, going from least less advanced tools going to more advanced tools. We see that in line with animal intelligence, with the ability to construct language the ability to pass on information from one generation to the next. I mean, why, based on your theology, these guys are all had IQs of like 700 and they're living to be eight or 900 years old. Why are they using stone tools? Why aren't they building rocket, rocket ships to go to the moon? Why are they banging flint rocks together and trying to figure out how to make fire? Why aren't they making computers and flying, going, flying into space? If what, if your version of history is true, because your version of history is not consistent with what we see. It's uh, what we like to call a fable. It's a fairy tale written by people who didn't know anything about anything. It's, uh, it's certainly not what we see in the fossil record. It's not what we know to be true. And uh, I, I get it. You're clinging on to your, your faith, but you can still cling on to your faith and you can also accept reality. And it is a matter of accepting it. It's a, I know you don't like that word, but it's a matter of accepting it, dealing with reality on its own terms. I invite you, Kent. You can still believe in God. You can still believe in Jesus, but you don't have to deny reality. All right. Thank you very much. I don't deny reality at all. The reality is cows produce cows, apes produce apes, monkeys produce monkeys. That's the reality. That's science. It is imagination to think we're related if you go back in time. You mentioned people living to be 900. The Bible says they did live to be over 900 before the flood came. Oh, get this over where you can read it. Okay. This is my chart I've got, and I'll send you one if you'd like. After the flood, lifespans dropped off. There are lots of legends from other countries, cultures of the world, talking about a golden age. They say, wow, man, you used to live to be 1,000. As far as why didn't they go to the moon, they were smart enough to know there's nothing up there. Why on earth do you want to go to the moon? Well, there's nothing there. It costs a whole lot of money to get what? Some rocks? Come to Atlantic, Alabama. We got a whole gravel pit full of rocks. We'll give you a truckload of them. That was one of the dumbest things we did. We gained a lot of cool science, but, you know, learning about rocketry and stuff like that. But it was a really expensive trip to get some rocks. I think it was dumb. I think anybody living to be 900 would be smart enough to know that's dumb. Why you want to do that? Okay, so we can talk about that as far as the tools that they made. Maybe they had other things we don't even know about, but that's a different story. Now, as far as you're claiming... <clears throat> that the, you keep mentioning the fossil record. I'm gonna keep mentioning there is no fossil record. There is no geologic column. You never answered the question, how can the top layer be younger? You say the fossils found in that layer would be the same age as the layer. That maybe makes a little sense, but all the layers are the same age. All the fossils are the same age, all of them. All the fossils were deposited in one big flood. There's no such thing as a fossil record. You mentioned it about 18 times now. So. Uh, we'll get so many topics going here. Lucy, uh, diversity. Sure, diversity happens. You said Lucy went extinct. I agree. You said Lucy probably had d d diversity of children or something. You don't know she had any children, and you don't know that they were diverse. Why don't the chimpanzees today make another human? Let's watch it. There are millions and millions of chimpanzees and monkeys and apes in the world, millions of them. None of them can do what you claim happened. None of them. You, you can't even make it happen in the laboratory. So uh, they, there have been so many lies over all these so-called cavemen, australopithecines and everything. Australopithecines are more different from African apes and humans in most features than these latter are from each other. Charles Oxnard at, uh, uh, let's see, in the book he wrote on that, let's see. They, all they do is draw lines on paper, connecting them, saying, oh, wow, look at this. We are related to this one. How do you know? Well, because Professor so-and-so said so. Oh, I don't believe him. Nobody's ever seen a human produce a non-human. Never. There's a whole variety of humans. I agree. There's humans that are seven feet tall. There's humans that are three feet tall. Do you think they'll ever get a human that is two inches tall, James? Will there ever be a human being two inches tall? I don't know, Kent. Maybe there will be, but you know, I mean, you 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 make you make like these ridiculous examples that have nothing to do with anything. It's uh, 
it's funny, but it's not it's not really germane to the to the topic that we're having. And I get it that, that maybe you're not curious about the natural world. You're content to just read the Bible and think God just did it all. And that's the end of your curiosity. But I think humans today are curious. We want to know what's on the moon. We want to know what those rocks are. We want to know what's going on up there. And I think humans with an IQ like of five or 700, like you say, they would have had, would have been curious about the natural world too. I don't think they would have been content to just look up there and say, oh, look at that nice light in the sky that God put up. Too bad we can't go up there because there's a an ice dome up there and our rockets will uh, crash into the ice dome that never existed. But, you know, I get it that you're incredulous or, well, I think you understand what I'm saying about the deposition of layers. And you said it kind of makes sense that if a layer is deposited at a certain time and we find an organism in that layer that, yeah, it probably was alive at the time the layer was deposited. It makes sense. You get it. But again, if what you're saying is true, it's all this global flood, then we should be able to radiometrically date all these layers. And they would all be the same. They would all date the same because they would have all been deposited at the same event. We know what flood deposits look like. We've seen them. There have been lots of floods over the course of human history. And like I said before, uh, your friend Charles Lyell, when he went out and started looking at the rocks and he didn't find flood deposits all over the world in one spot the way you would find if Noah's flood were true. He found and he had to admit that uniformitarianism was probably the biggest explanation for most of the geological features we see that long, slow processes with occasional catastrophes are the norm. We, we get occasional cataclysmic events, but most of the history of life on Earth is just gradual, slow processes. And that's what produced the fossil record. That's how evolution works, slow, gradual process. And Lucy, Kent, Lucy at her time was doing exactly the same thing that apes today are doing, exactly the same thing, reproducing with variation. As I said, we get it. You're incredible. You don't think it can happen. You don't think a slow progression could add up to large changes. But as unintuitive as it is, that is the most reasonable logical explanation that we have for what we see in the fossil record. And it, it is a record. All right. You are still stuck saying the word fossil record, words fossil record over and over and over again, trying to convince sorry, yourself. Ben. Okay. Let I'm me point sorry. out my points I mentioned earlier. These have never been answered. Number one, no fossil could count as being transitional because you could not prove it had any children. Would you agree you cannot prove that particular fossil had offspring? Would you agree with that? We prove a particular fossil had offspring in the overwhelming majority of cases, no. Good. Majority of cases, in every case, you could not prove any fossil had children, none. Would you admit that? In the majority of cases, I guess I think sometimes you could see. I think so. Oh, you've you've seen seen fish uh, that were uh, fossilized while giving birth. You could you could assume that uh, some fish at, at that point were giving birth, right? If we see one doing it, they all, it's and rational to assume others were doing it, right? Well, that that particular one, no, died in the process of giving birth. You can't prove it at any kids that lived. Now, you could never prove it had kids different from itself. Does any animal do. today, does any animal yes. today produce offspring that are different enough to raise questions like, whoa, that's changing to something. What animals today are changing, do you think, to something else? All animals. All animals are transitional, Kent. And I, like, I, yes, you don't see how the small changes can add up over time. You don't see it, but... That's why it took so long for this reality to become apparent. That's why it took so long. We didn't come up with evolution right away. It took a long time and a very smart individual named Charles Darwin to see these small variations in offspring and realize that the environment was selecting from the mutations that, uh, oh my gosh, Kent. <laughs> That's it. Uh, That's your time. You, 
You've lost it, Kent. You, you've uh... because it's dumb. It's easy to mock. No animal today can produce kids other than their kind. I agree. They there's variations. Good. There's variations, but there. Would you agree the variations are limited? From one generation to the next, yes, sure, yeah. You're not going to have. You only have a certain number of mutations from one generation to the next. Can you name some good mutations that would change it to something else? It's not that it changes it to something else. It is something else. If you're, oh. your son has mutations that you don't have. He is a different person than you, Kent. So that's a different, that's something else. You guys are still in the same species. You're one generation apart. But remember what I said with Lucy, we have 128,000 generations. That's a lot of time, Kent. Each step along the way is a very, very small step. Yep. Get more time. Out. No, no, more, no, more time. time. Yeah. More time. And, That'll help. And, well, and that's why you start with video one, attacking the age of the earth, because once you know that we have this time, it's all over. And it is. We do have the time. Uh, after you're done with your evolution series, I love to debate you on age of the earth, because okay. like I said, we've gone through it. And so many people have gone through it. The earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Deep time works. Humans are about 250,000 years old. That's what all the evidence shows. Uh, but I realize you have a book that says something different. So, Well, you think you have deep time. It, we have deep time. We have millions of generations can be produced in a few hundred years of amoeba. Why don't we see there are 20,000 species at least of single cell creatures? Amoeba, paramecium, etc. Do any of those, are any of those in the observable lifetime of a human being, which is hundreds of their generations, do any of those ever produce something other than what they were? Do amoeba always stay amoeba? Do you know of any examples well, that they changed? Well, Kent, like uh, Atheist Jr. pointed out to you in the one debate that you uh, have never fully addressed the issue with the algae observing to, being observed to become multicellular. And that is a very rare event that would happen. You would only expect that to happen a few times over the course of Earth history, but yet we witnessed it in the laboratory. And if it can happen in the laboratory, Kent, we can make the logical inference that it can happen in the wild too. And billions of years ago, it did happen. And, you know, you're talking about these amoeba that, have all these generation time, but you, you have to understand these amoeba have been evolving for billions of years. Okay. That's at their state. You're talking about, well, why don't they change in what is to that? Like the blink of an eye, a hundred years when they've been producing this way for all these years and they are already very well suited for the environment. They don't need to change in anything else. They're doing just fine. Can't be an amoebas. And that's all evolution cares about. It doesn't care about intelligence. It doesn't care about size. It just cares about you being able to eat enough food so you don't die for another day until you can reproduce. That's what evolution cares about. The amoebas are doing just fine. They don't need to change into anything else. If they, any mutation would probably be deleterious. But before I let go, go back to you, you, you asked about mutations. And like I told you in our last debate, we've got mutations of... Uh, people who have been found to have higher bone density and they, therefore they, in car crashes, they're less likely to break bones. We've got the family in Italy whose body naturally produces less cholesterol. Therefore they have much lower risk of heart disease. Um, we do have these mutations that pop up, like most of them are neutral, but occasionally once in a rare while, there is a beneficial mutation that natural selection can select and it does. Wouldn't it be much more likely then for the negative mutations to wipe out the species? If the good mutations happen once in a while, but the large percentage of them are neutral or bad, it's much more likely to wipe out that species than to create a new species. But yet your whole religion is hanging on that thin thread that, well, maybe with enough time it could happen. I think we could do a debate on time. First of all, time won't help. It's not going to help. It's, time makes things worse. Everything's running down. We get bigger and bigger genetic load with every type of creature. It's more and more problems. Everything's winding, falling apart. Nothing gets better with time. 
But in your imagination, wow, give me that pacifier. So would you agree, let me finish my list here, no animal today can produce kids that would be considered a different kind. Would they, be, would all, would they all be classed by any scientist as the same uh, genus? The word species is kind of nebulous. But would, Absolutely. Okay, you think they would, all right? No, no, no. No animal is going to have offspring that are a different species than the parent. That's Yay. not going to happen. Bingo. Then you got it. Evolution Boom. doesn't happen. No. That so we, we, we don't see it happen in a generation, but we can imagine it happened over millions of generations. Yeah, that's the, that thing about inductive reasoning, Kent. That's that okay. thing about making logical inferences that when we see very small variation, by, by, by that explanation, you know, we, we should be clueless as to how Italian language, how did you go from Latin to Italian? I mean... How did it happen? Well, we know how it happened. It happened very slowly over a long period of time by people speaking and the language very gradually changing. At no point, Kent, in that transition did Latin-speaking parents give birth to an Italian-speaking child. That never happened. If you took one person, their language, and you looked 100 years in the future, 100 years in the past, you would see changes, but it would be fairly similar. Just like with English, Ken, if you look at English 100 years ago, you'd be able, be able to understand almost everything, right? You'd be able to read it 200 years ago. three, Yeah, it would gradually get less and less able for you to understand it. If you looked at it 1,000 years ago, you'd barely be able to make anything out. It might as well be Chinese. That's how it happens very gradually over long periods of time. And you get that. I know you get that. You're just... Oh, yeah. uh, you understand it, Kent. You've got your doctorate. You taught science. You know, understand these things. Help me, Kent. I, I understand completely that languages change because a lot of intelligent people are changing the words. This is not the same as biological changes that you think going to turn an amoeba to a human. This is very different than language. That's a lousy example. And as far as the changes accumulating, okay, get your cow, go to the rodeos in Texas where they jump cows over fences, Find out what the world's record is. Say it's uh, three foot six, okay? Could you give your cow vitamins and could you make it work out at the gym and make it eventually jump over the moon? Do you think there's a limit less than the moon? Well, I mean, Kent, my example about languages is, is actually much better than the example you like to give, which is about cars, about lining up cars from Ford to Chevy, which cars don't reproduce themselves. It's a completely useless analogy. Um, but languages, it, the, it's intelligent people speaking the languages, but the changes are not intelligently done. It's not necessarily a committee of people saying, okay, we're going to use these words now. We're not going to use these. It's individual people just talking and using the words that they choose to use. And over time, the language naturally evolves. What was the last question you asked, Ken? I want to make sure I address it. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. What? What was the last question you asked? I want to make sure I address it. Um, oh, could you eventually get your cow to jump over the moon? Oh, right, right, right. Probably not. Like you would never yeah. get a Texas-sized pig, but there's reasons for that. And there's, right, uh, right, right. Good. At least we're getting somewhere. So there are limits. Now, whether we agree on what the limit is, we can argue all night, but there is a limit. Okay. This chart shows humans and birds going back to a common ancestor with the dinosaurs and the ladybugs and the pine trees and the worms. Do you believe you have a distant ancestor that is the same ancestor as a ladybug? Are you related to a ladybug? Of course, Kent. You know that. You know we're going to say yes to that. But uh, I, yes. I, can't, I can't take your fun away from you. You have fun with it, so I'll let you have your fun. But yes, Kent. Related to ladybugs, mosquitoes, pine trees, aardvarks, amoebas, have your pick of it. We are related. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you admitted that because that is what they're teaching the kids. And so this is more your chart you want to talk about tonight. All the different creatures, the lemurs, the apes, the chimpanzees, the orangutans, the baboons have all a common homos. What? All of them. All, you, all the homos. All of them are related. Yes. All okay. the homos are related. How many Homo How erectus did Noah take on the ark? How many what now? How, how many Homo erectus did Noah take on the ark? 
how were about they, how many homo homes? erectus clean or unclean oh i don't did know you, i did a study on did that you eat a homo but, erectus in the under the jewish dietary laws were they considered clean <laughs> well mary leakey who believed in evolution very strongly said those trees of life with the branches of our ancestors are a lot of nonsense huh she didn't believe it she believed I mean, you are a primate this textbook says okay we are you can believe that if you want i am not family portrait all the monkeys all the apes baboons chimpanzees gibbons having a common ancestor this is nothing but lines on paper family trees are baloney i have a family tree that goes back to norway and i don't know how far back it goes probably they didn't move around much back then but they were all human every one of them to claim that you're related to a ladybug is i think obviously funny to laugh at and i will be continuing to laugh at that okay but and I, I think you really believe it. There's no question. Yeah, I believe yeah, you are yeah. sincere. This is Absolutely. what you were taught. You were you believe you're related to a ladybug. Okay. I maybe you are. I am not. Okay. I don't think we've ever seen a human produce a non-human or a ladybug produce a non-ladybug. It's never been observed. You can imagine going back to a common ancestor. How are you going to change? You said this algae. I'll I'll do a whole spirit series. Matt, write that down. We can do. Because the guy said about the algae becoming multicellular. I asked him. Atheist he never Jr. Answered the huh? Your debate with Atheist Jr. Yeah. Who did this multicellular algae marry? How did it, did it reproduce? <laughs> they made it in the laboratory. Where is it today? Is it still around? Did it go extinct? I don't extinct? think they reproduce like that, Kent. Okay. And I, I haven't followed. I'd have to look at, at the scientific literature on that to see what they're still doing with it. That's a fair question. Good. Okay. All right. So the topic for the debate tonight is where's the evidence for evolution? You're claiming evolution, yeah. you are claiming that you are related to these uh, ape-like creature, and your evidence so far has been we find fossils. I pointed out you can't prove any of the fossils had children that lived. You don't know you're related to an ape. You believe that very strongly, and I'm sure you'll state it again right now. We are apes. Okay, I, I heard you. We are. Yeah, right. Oh, thank you. But that's that's a religious belief. It's not observable. Prediction. Are there any testable prediction? Okay. Are are there any differences between you and a baboon? Of course, Kent. But but like I said, we have the test. You just did a testable prediction. You predicted that I would say that there were that we're apes, and I did. That's a testable prediction. Science does that all the time. I predict that when we keep digging around in that dirt, we're going to keep finding more hominid ancestors that fill these gaps between the ones that we have now. I bet that that's what we've been doing, and that's what we'll continue to be doing. And you guys are going to keep grasping for straws to try to make it seem like these are not our ancestors, that either they all lived at the same time or they're all mis misidentified conglomerations of bones. But... Is that really reasonable, Ken? Is that really reasonable for? I mean, that's a that's almost as unreasonable as when you say that. Um, you know, every time you're asked about, well, how did we get all these cats from two cats getting off a of Noah's Ark, and you never have an answer for that. You just pivot to say, oh, well, how do you know about a dot of nothing? So, if you can't tell me a dot of nothing, how can I tell you about two cats? And then in a hundred years, we have. Uh, Lions, tigers, cheetahs, jaguars, you don't have an answer for that. So you pivot the dot of nothing. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, we don't need to prove which ones had kids. We know that some of them did. We know they had parents. We know each animal was close to a breeding population of its organisms. And for you to just say, well, we don't know, that's not a serious uh you're not being serious. You're just trying to find a way to dismiss what's right in front of you. And I get it. You don't want to read the writing on the wall, but I'm suggesting that uh, you should. Okay, let me jump in, gentlemen. Um, James, since you started the discussion, Kent, take as much time as you need to respond. And then, James, your next response is going to be your five-minute concluding statement because we do have audience questions and I want to have some time for that. So Kent, go ahead, respond to that. And then we're jumping into uh, closing statements. Go ahead. Okay. I predict they will keep digging in the dirt. I predict they will keep finding more fossils. I predict they will try to put them in a sequence in some kind of order. 
That is not science, okay? That is predetermined. I've already decided we evolved from an ape. Now let's find the missing link. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. The chain does not exist. Humans make humans, givens make givens, lemurs make lemurs, no exceptions. I predict they will find fossil graveyards where there are thousands and thousands of animals all buried together and all fossilized. How does that happen without some kind of flood and rapid burial? Fossils don't form today. I predict you will not be able to show me any place on the planet where there are large numbers of fossils forming, even though millions of animals die every day. They, they don't fossilize. I predict you will find skeletons today of animals that die get scattered within the first couple days. The coyotes, the buzzards, the ants, they drag them around. I predict we'll find fossils of fully articulated skeletons. All the bones are laid there together. This thing wasn't scavenged. It was buried before it could be scavenged. I predict you will find millions and millions of fully articulated skeletons. I think that's evidence for a flood, a rapid burial. I predict you'll find skeletons of animals that died in Antarctica. I predict you'll find skeletons of animals that died in Greenland. I predict you'll find them in the middle of whale. I predict there'll be whale fossils found in the middle of the Sahara Desert. I think there was a flood. The Bible says in the last days there'll be scoffers who are ignorant, willingly ignorant of that flood. That's you, James. All those layers are the same age. There is no fossil record. There is no geologic column. All the layers form in one year. The top layer is the same age as the bottom layer. It was positioned there later within a year. Shuffling my cards does not make the top card younger. I can change the position, but it came in the same deck, okay? The four of spades is the same age as the two of clubs. And there is no such thing as a fossil record. There's no such thing as a geologic column. It's baloney. I'm, I, that wasn't taught until 1830. All the scientists before that believed all the layers were formed by the flood. You think that one guy, James Hutton, proved them all wrong? Well, it's time for Kent Hovind to prove all the ones today. They're all wrong. There's no fossil record. It doesn't exist. And time is not going to help, James. More time is not going to help. Maybe we should get another pacifier with infinite time on it. Matt, what do you think? You got pacifiers. You got a baby? Yep. Put one that says infinite time. It's not going to help. Cows produce cows, James. No exceptions. Over time, cows are still going to produce cows. So I think evolution's dumb. I've said it many times. It's the most dangerous religion in the history of the world. And you swallowed it. I want to try to get you out of that cult. Oh, got a hair in my eye here. Okay, I'm done. Dan, Donnie? <laughs> okay, thank you, Kent. That ends the discussion period. Uh, oh, James boy. W. and uh, Kent, fantastic discussion. We've had over you know 300 people in the chat. This has been a much anticipated round three, chapter three, end game debate between James W. and Kent. So, uh, James W., you get five minute response or a five minute concluding statement. Kent gets five minutes, then we'll get through a few audience questions and we're going to wrap it up. So, James, whenever you're ready, five minutes, the floor is yours. Well, Kent, I, 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 wasn't ex I wasn't expecting you to use the word cult. Um, I, I didn't think you would use that word. But anyway, uh, it's good, nice that you have Matt Powell there. So you have an infinite number of pacifiers. Anytime you need some, you can just slap whatever, whatever words you need to put on it and have yourself a good time. But yeah, humans make humans. But the fossil record tells us that humans have changed over time, that Modern humans, when we date them, are, have only been around for about 250, at the most, 300,000 years. And when we date the fossils that we find older than that, we find things that are not quite modern humans, but not quite what you would consider to be an ape, because we're all apes, but monkeys or other uh, primates. And we have this sequence, and it goes in order. And we see... Humans, less human-like, less human-like, less human-like. We see hu the tools that humans make, less advanced tools, less advanced tools, less advanced tools. And this history is recorded in the... I get that he doesn't like it. It doesn't, it doesn't line up with uh, the mythology that he's been uh, taught to believe. It doesn't line up with what he preaches, but... He is, uh, he's dedicated to it, so you have to give him credit for that. Fossils forming today, I mean, 
we've gone over this before. Kent thinks that uh, he's got fossilized acorns or and all these crazy fossilized pickles uh, that formed in a freezer or a refrigerator. Who knows how the minerals got in there to uh, to replace the material? Because as he should know, Potter science fossilization is not minerals covering something it's minerals replacing the original material so where the minerals come from in a refrigerator to replace that of a pickle in the course of a year i don't know maybe he has an explanation for that or he could just admit that it's not an actual fossil and that this process while it can take markedly less typically takes a very 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 long time animal fossils warming today would be impossible for us to tell because it would take that long for us to see which fossils form. But we know that we formed a lot of them in the past, and he's got a an ad hoc explanation for that, a global flood that his uh, mythology talks about that is contradicted by virtually every area of science. Everything that we know about the natural world conflicts with this fable. Um, but he sticks to it, and I understand why, because it's the only thing he has. It's the only thing they have to explain geology. It's a very bad explanation, by the way. It's a bad explanation, but it's all they've got. So he talked about animals in Antarctica or Greenland, whales in the Sahara Desert, and he rejects the idea of uh, India slamming into Asia to make the Himalayan mountains, even though there's an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that. But what he doesn't understand is that the earth is billions of years old and these the crust has been shuffled and recycled and formed many, many times over. There were there were supercontinents before Pangaea. This crust has been moving around and shifting for a very, very long time. And isn't that amazing that what we can tell, that we can tell that there were supercontinents before Pangaea, that we can tell that the way the continents are moving today, eventually they will all be combined again. And when that happens, religion will long since be abandoned. Nobody will be looking up in the sky waiting for Jesus to come back because he never came in the first place. And if that makes me a scoffer, I mean, it is what it is. I'm just saying there are, there are more of us joining every day. The, the church pews are emptying out. He would say it's uh, the great apostasy, the great falling away, whatever. People are abandoning Christianity en masse. That temple is never going to be rebuilt. He'll have to rehash his eschatology again in a few years because uh, the woe book that he put out, none of that's going to happen. It's interesting fiction but none of it's going to happen there's not going to be a temple built there's not going to be a treaty signed none of that is ever going to happen and uh yeah people will eventually abandon religion as they should and remember it only as an artifact humanity's first attempt at understanding the natural world before we knew enough to be able to come up with a coherent idea of what was really happening so we have to understand religion for what One it was minute. but we don't have to soldier on and pretend that it, it comports with reality because it clearly does it. Science is taking the information that we have available to us, making reasonable assumptions, making logical inferences, and coming up with models that work that make accurate predictions about reality. We predict that what we look in the, in the ground we will find fossils that eventually look less and less human and more ape-like. That's exactly what we find. We are apes. We evolved from other primates, and we will continue to evolve whatever we evolve into. We will still be apes. We will still be humans. We will still be mammals. And, uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Donnie for hosting me, and thank you, Kent, for uh, participating. All right, that's five minutes. Five minute concluding statement. Uh, thank you, James. You're having too much fun there, Kent. Hey, love it. <laughs> hey, hey, that's what it's all about having some fun while debating these important topics, right? So, Kent, there over you to you. Five minutes whenever you're ready, brother. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this again, James. I guess we won't get you converted tonight. I'll keep trying, though. Uh, <clears throat> the textbooks continually say we have evidence for evolution, evidence from fossils, guys. No fossil is going to count. 
evidence from structure, similar structure. No, that's evidence of a common designer. Evidence from molecular biology, from development. I can't believe they're still teaching that one. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. You covered them tonight. Mutations make something new and better. That's not observable. You can believe that. N nearly all the mutations are harmful or fatal. They say natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. That's really a stretch. If you get one new improved buffalo, therefore it's going to take over the whole world of buffalo. If you get one algae that learns how to combine with some more and make a two-celled algae or three-celled algae, therefore it's got to take over the world population of algae. That's what your religion teaches. Evolution's a religion of death. All those that are not evolved have to die. The new improved version is the only one that gets to survive. The rest have to die for the good of the species. Mutations are random events and they are harmful, okay? But Darwin said, it's a wonderful fact, all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. This is a lie. There's no evidence any plant or animal has ever produced something different. No matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. They rearrange existing genes. This cow had the genetic gene pool to make a leg. It made one on the wrong spot on his back. There's no new information. It's a leg. He already had a leg. It made another one. It's a bad mutation. There's no scientific evidence to support the evolution theory except lies proven wrong many years ago. Here's a short-legged sheep. That's a mutant. It's not new information. It already had legs. They're just shorter than normal. And some sailors decided, hey, our decks on the ship are kind of close together. Let's, let's breed these short-legged sheeps and get a whole herd of them. We can carry them on the, on the, deck, on the ships easier. Okay. It's a mutant. The ancorn sheep was capitalized on, and the cow that gives more milk was capitalized on, and farmers now have dairy cows. Let loose in the woods, there wouldn't be any dairy cows. They'd still produce milk, but only enough for their baby. But they've capitalized on the change, and there's a limit. I, met, I saw the cow that gives 100 pounds of milk a day. It's in, it was in Kankakee, Illinois, when I was teaching school. took my students there. I don't, I, I'd be willing to predict they'll never get a cow that'll give a trillion tons of milk a day. That I'll predict. There's a limit. Is 100 pounds the limit? Probably. Maybe 105. Maybe somebody broke the record. 105 pounds a day. Okay. They're never going to get 10,000 pounds a day. There's a limit. There's a two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. It's not ninja, but it's mutant. Nobody makes a double neck turtle neck sweater. Rearranging the letters of the word Christmas will get you all kinds of words, but it won't get you Xerox, zebra, or queen. And re-examining re or reshuffling the genes of an ape is not going to get you a human. There's a mutant fly. It says, this normal flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. But then it goes on to say, beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Hello, why didn't they give us an example of a beneficial mutation? This four-winged fly can't fly. It's a crawl, it's not a fly. They talk about sickle cell anemia becoming a beneficial mutation. Right, you want to get sickle cell? Anyway, my, my closing statement would be, Nobody's ever observed what James believes in. He believes if we had enough time, the amoeba would turn to the whole family tree. He believes he's related to a ladybug. And a, you're welcome to believe that. James, I admire your faith. You think you're related to a dinosaur. You think you're related to a bird and a monkey. And you think you all have a common ancestor with a worm, which was a single-celled creature. You believe all these monkeys and apes and gibbons are related to you. You're welcome to believe that. That's not observable science. I started off with the definition of science. What do we observe, study, test, demonstrate? Do it in the laboratory. Get a bunch of lemurs and turn them into anything besides a lemur. Or a bunch of apes or monkeys or chimpanzees, whatever you want to start with. I'd be willing to predict you will never get them to change to anything other than the obvious same kind. It doesn't happen. Those trees of life are nonsense. You can draw lines on paper and you think you're a primate. You think you're an ape. I'm beginning to believe you, James. I'm over. Done. Bye. Okay. Thank you, uh, James and Kent. Five minutes on the dot. Great job with the timing. And let's get into some audience questions because uh, it seems like we've got one question per viewer. So about 300. So again, Kent and James, thank you so much. And uh, to let the audience know, the next debate 
uh, in terms of the Evolution Debate Challenge series is this Friday, I believe it is, the 22nd. Double check the calendar. Uh, T-Jump and Dr. Dino, the epic rematch. This one specifically on testable predictions. So that'll be this Friday, the 22nd. Okay, let's get into some Good questions. Good luck with that, Kent. What? Good luck with that debate, Kent, with Tom Jump. Uh, no problem. Okay, here we go, gentlemen. So let's start uh, right at the beginning here. And um, okay, so Super Chat comes in. Mark Reed. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark and Kent debated last week. That was a fantastic debate. So Amazing debate. Uh, so Mark asks Kent, what is the specific processes and mechanisms that limits an organism from evolving past a specific point and keeps them in the same kind. Well, I think anybody that studies biology or anatomy will tell you there's a genetic code that all life forms seem to have, and the humans have a genetic code that only allows them to produce other humans. You will never find a couple uh, mate and produce uh, anything other than a human. You never find a cow produce a non-cow. So I would say certainly one of the obvious limits is genetics. We have an incredibly complex gene code. The gene code of an amoeba is more complicated than the instructions to build a space shuttle. That's just one single cell. The, and the, the genetic code of a lily is mind boggling in its complexity. I think the genetic code of a lily contains more information than Microsoft Word. There's a lot of lines of code in Microsoft Word, and there's more lines of code to make a, a lily or an amoeba. So I think the limit would be uh, certainly DNA or the chromosomes or the gene code is, is definitely a, a, a limiting factor. That's why humans only produce humans. No exceptions. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Kent. Uh, James W., if there's anything you wanted to add, go ahead. And, and this is a question I've asked Kent several times on other debates. He's been asked this multiple times. He never really has a good explanation because, yeah, DNA changes. It changes over time. It changes between one generation to the next. Kents don't produce Kents. They produce very slightly different Kents. And this change does add up over time, and it really does produce macroscopic changes. And, and that's the thing. DNA change, he brings up like letters, you'll never get this letter, but the DNA is only made up of those four letters. So constantly re-scrambling those letters will always get you a different result. Whether it produces a different feature or not depends on what specific part of the DNA is mutating, but that is why change occurs because it does have limits in terms of a species. Species have a shelf life. This is part of the whole genetic entropy thing that they don't understand that, that it's accumulating enough mutations that it cannot be the same species. It will eventually speciate once it accumulates enough of those mutations, but there's no limits arbitrarily imposed God is not coming into the DNA once it accumulates enough mutations and saying, thou shall not mutate. Nope. They just keep right on accumulating and the species keeps right on changing over time. Okay. Thank you, James. And Kent, question was for you. We'll give you the last word. Well, I should have also mentioned there are obvious physical limits. Uh, you cannot get a cow as big as Texas. Uh, you cannot get a cow to jump over the moon. There are physical limits, there are genetic limits, and rearranging the genetic code will make a lot of variations of there's, what, 1,100 kinds of different apples now. But they've never been able to make a non-apple. Interesting. Farmers have been trying for years to selectively breed their apples, and they get big ones and little ones and sweet ones and sour ones and ones that hand hot climate and cold climate, and they're still apple. 1,100 species of bats, 4,000 species of potatoes. They're still potato. Nobody's ever seen any plant or animal produce offspring that would anybody would consider a different kind. There are limits. Rearranging the letters of the word Christmas will never get you a Chinese sentence. Never. It's not available. The gene code does not make availability to produce evolution like you guys dream about, even given trillions of years. The genetic code limits it. It can't happen. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that final word, Kent. Next question comes in from Wade Robbins. Wade, a uh, question for you, Kent. 
Uh, he says, a bulldog shares a common ancestor with a wolf. And yet we've never observed a wolf produce a bulldog. How is this possible? Well, I think we know that the dogs, wolves, and coyotes are related because they all interbreed today. There's a coyote hybrid dog. Let's see. They've been now at 339 breeds of dogs. The American Kennel Association says so. Okay. Dog, wolf, coyote probably had a common ancestor, but it doesn't mean they're related to a banana. A four-year-old will tell you that. I had a three-year-old tell me the other day, which one's different? A banana. God said they'll bring forth after their kind. So all we've ever ob observed is dogs, wolves, coyotes probably had a common ancestor. They're similar. They can interbreed. And the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. So if we see, what was the question exactly? We've never seen a bulldog come from a wolf. I think if you gave uh, somebody uh, a pack of wolves and gave them enough time, like maybe 500 years, they could slowly selectively breed the puppies and end up with something that we would consider a bulldog. I had a family in one of my seminars, they said, Mr. Oven, we've been in the dog kennel breeding business for 100 years, three generations. She, the lady said, I can tell you right now, you give us a couple of generic mutts, and within 100 years, we'll make every species of dog you can find. We'll make a Chihuahua and a Great Dane in 100 years through selective breeding. Now, neither the Chihuahua nor the Great Dane would survive in the wild on their own. Almost all the dogs man has produced have to be baby. You got to babysit them. You got to feed them. They don't survive in the woods. So here's a hybrid koi dog. Let's see. Uh, West, male Western wolves successfully breed with Western coyotes. Oh, okay. 40 species of wolf. Might have had a common ancestor. But see, the example he gave, a wolf and a bulldog, any three-year-old will tell you it's the same kind of animal. It's in the dog family. So I think, does that, would therefore, would that prove in Wade's mind, does that prove that bulldogs and bananas have a common ancestor? He probably thinks they do. Go ahead. Thank you, Kat. James, go ahead. Well, what Ken mentioned before, that uh, the DNA code for all animals is the same. All species alive today use either DNA or RNA, so the letters are there. They're there. We can get them from any animal. We, we have it, Ken. But what I'm saying is, just like dogs and wolves are the same kind, I'm saying humans, all the homos, Lucy, all the Australopithecines are in the same kind, the people kind, the human kind. Any three-year-old, you could put an Australopithecine, a human, a Neanderthal, and a beach ball. They're all going to know that all the, uh, the human, the Australopithecine, and the Neanderthal are in the same kind. You would place beach ball with a, uh, a conch. They're going to know that all those are in the same kind. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Human evolution. We are all in the same kind. We are apes. We are primates. The people kind. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, James. And Ken, if you wanted a final word, since the question was yours, go ahead. No, that's fine. I think I proved my point. Go ahead. Okay. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Next question comes in from... Uh, make sure I didn't lose it here. Chat is flying. Okay, right here. So this one again is for you, Kent. This one comes in from SWE. Thank you so much for the support and questions. So she asks, regarding Australopithecus, so I'm guessing Australopithecus afarensis, so Lucy, what do you make of the intermediate traits? A big brain for its size, arboreal and bipedal, wide sacrum, five fused sacral vertebra like us, so on and so forth. So, um, I don't know if I have a complete answer to that one. That would be something worth looking into. If there are similarities, does therefore that prove a relationship or a common designer? Uh, the five fused sacral vertebrae are uh, essential for your hips and for walking and things like that. I think if they were not fused, it'd be more difficult. Certainly the uh, tail is very different. We, we have a tail bone that supports muscles that allow reproduction. The chimpanzees and apes that have a tail have muscles attaching to the first few vertebrae in their tail to, so they can make baby whatever they are. Chimps make baby chimps every time. So again, I would point out, we never see these animals produce a, a different than their kind now. Why do you think these bones could do it? That's not science. 
That's my whole point. It's, it's, it's imagine, even if it's true, it's still not science. It's not observable. It's not testable. It's not knowledge. It's imagination. So the uh, intermediate traits, bigger brain for its size. I'd have to do, if you take talk about Lucy, I think Lucy has been discredited many years ago. I don't know why they still bring up Lucy or Australopithecines at all. But some animals might have gone extinct. Some animals might have had a bigger brain and gone extinct. So, so what? It's not proof that we're related. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. Uh, James, quick word if you'd like. I would just say Lucy has only been discredited in the minds of Kent and people who uh, adhere to the same radical views that he does. But in the scientific community, no, we have over 300 examples of Australopithecus afarensis Lucy. And I would just ask, how many uh, Lucys were on the ark, Kent? Oh, Go ahead, Ken, if you, want to, if you want a final word, you can answer that. Yeah, I think Noah might have taken uh, two apes, two gibbons, two chimpanzees. And okay. after the flood, they produced babies of the same kind. I don't think apes and gibbons and chimpanzees are related. I think they have similarities because they got the same designer. They have to do the same things in life. They have to get around, find food, raise babies, climb trees. No problem. Why don't any humans have a prehensile foot where they can grab their tree branch and swing? like an ape does. We're, we're, we're designed differently. Very, there are thousands of differences between humans and, and chimpanzees. Thousands of, tens of thousands of differences. So if you want to believe you're related to one, okay. I, I, apparently I can't talk you out of that. Okay, yeah. thank you, Kent. And now a couple of uh, super chat questions for you, James, and then, then we'll kind of uh, wrap it up here. Time's flying by. So this one comes in from Bubblegum Gun, $5 super chat, and uh, we'll read it together here. So he's saying... No algae. So it looks like he's referring back to the, uh, you know, sure single to multi-celled algae example. No algae did not become multicellular, only like structures. It's just cluster because it lost its mobility and divides again when it becomes mobile again. So I guess more of a comment, uh, James. Therefore, if you wanted to respond, go ahead. Well, no, this is true multicellularity because unlike a colonial organism, these, they cannot survive independently once they break apart. There are colonies where single cells group together for a common purpose for a time. And then after that purpose is over, they re-divide themselves and they go back on being single celled. That's not what happened with this algae experiment. It's true multicellularity. Okay, Ken, did you want a response or you want me to move right to the next well, one? Yeah, I, I have a note to myself to do more research on that. But I, I said the first time this came up, I said, I doubt it's a multicellular creature. It's a colony. It's a cluster of things working together. And maybe the, this uh, bubblegum is right that it cannot, uh, uh, it, it lost its mobility. Is that true? I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that one yet, but I'll, I'll do some research on it. Good question. A good comment, though. Okay, appreciate it. James, did you want a quick final word since it was directed at you? No, you can move on. All right. Appreciate it. Next one comes in from One God is Now Here. Uh, thank you for the question and support. He says, uh, James W., please refute this. Science proves apes produce apes. Science says, he says apes produce humans. I'm just going to guess that he meant to say, uh, science, scientists say, um, oh, no, wait. Okay. So scientists say apes produce humans. Science is right. Scientists are wrong. Okay. I understand it now. I think what he's trying to say. Go ahead, James. Apes do produce apes and apes do produce humans because humans are apes. That he's completely missed the entire point of that. Now, I know what he's saying. Oh, other non-human apes produce other non-human apes. And that's true what we see in the short term, but I hate to break it to you, but what we observe in our one lifetime is not the subtotal of history on this planet. Things happen that things happen that take longer than a human lifetime to observe. And it is science. It absolutely is science. When we look in the past and we look back and we see animals that bridge that gap that are not alive today, and we find no modern humans. We find humans that bridge the gap between humans and other primates. And it is only logical and reasonable to make the inference that we evolved from lower primates. And that's why we're here today. That's why they're no longer here, because they went extinct and they became us. 
Okay, thank you, James. Kent, anything you wanted to add to that? Well, yeah, great, great point. Uh, they prove apes produce apes. He believes, or he says, apes produce humans. So, therefore, by that logic, he says we are apes. Are we still ladybugs? Are you still a ladybug, James? We're not ladybugs, but we are eukaryotes. We are, we do share a common ancestry with ladybugs. All right, here's the next one. Um, Boomer21, thank you so much. Uh, $10 super chat and questions for you, James. So he asked, if you're an atheist, then how do you uh, explain the discoveries of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and the Red Sea crossing and, and so on and so forth? Any thoughts on that, James? Yeah. Okay. So we've got one dude, Ron Wyatt, who's been dead for 20 years now or longer than that, who made all these discoveries that virtually everybody else in archaeology does not agree with. So we have one dude no longer alive. And we have the entire field of archaeology, ancient history, all saying different things. He found things that he thinks sort of line up with the Bible. Well, that's not how we do science. That's not how we do archaeology. That's not how we do anything. You don't begin with your conclusion and say, well, I've got a Bible and it has these stories in it. Let me go out and look and see if I can find anything that sort of lines up with that. Uh, completely brought bad methodology from the start. And bad methodology leads to bad results. Okay, thank you, Boomer, for the super chat and question. James, thanks for your response. Kent, anything you'd like to add? Well, I think scores of things from the Bible have been proven with archaeology. I think a quick Google search would show you, forget Ron Wyatt. I knew Ron. I think he was right that these things were found. But I think there have been scores of other things. Ancient cities have been found. Lots of things have been found from that the Bible said happened, and they find, yep, it happened. So I think you're, you're really dismissing a whole lot of hundreds of years Actually, for several thousand years, people have been digging around and they find things and say, wow, look at this. This is the ancient city of whatever. If you found a whale in the Sahara Desert, you would believe it was a whale. But you won't believe when somebody finds Sodom and Gomorrah, or sulfur balls. Thousands and thousands of sulfur balls mixed in with the clay. It didn't happen anywhere else in the world. I think that was Sodom and Gomorrah. But no, no amount is going to convince James. But I think a logical, rational person would say, wow. There is archaeological evidence for the Bible being true. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. James, you can have a final word. Yeah. So there are scores. There are things in the Bible. They occasionally, through happenstance or dumb luck, got some things right, right? Um, like the name of a city. If the Bible gets the name of a city wrong and we find the city, that just means the city existed. It doesn't mean the supernatural claims are true. And... Uh, you know, we find sulfur balls. Could we possibly think there could be another explanation for that other than the God of the universe nuking a city because there were gay people that lived there and they committed a the horrible act, a disgusting act of not wanting to rape Lot's daughters. Instead, they preferred the men. So God decided to nuke the city from it. It's, uh, it's a thoroughly disgusting story and uh i'm surprised well knowing that what they believe i'm not surprised that they bring it up but it really doesn't bode well for their god all right well i'm gonna have to uh pick out this last question we did hit the two hour mark and we do try to keep these in 90 minutes we can't seem to do it because we get a ton of questions and i do thank everybody for their questions this has been an awesome debate very engaging one to remember for sure and so i do apologize to anybody whose question i didn't get to uh we've got a ton more of these uh debates in the uh coming months so just bring those same questions to future debates and we'll uh, make sure to get to them so this is the last one this was going to be for you kent this one comes in again from swe thank you so much and um she asks genetically speaking why is it hard to believe chimpanzees and humans are related less than 1.5 percent codon different when we readily accept mice and rats are related kent go ahead well i don't know that those numbers are correct i have to do some research on that but who said who said mice and rats are related they're similar. 
I don't know that rats can ever produce mice babies or mice can ever produce rat babies. I never said they're similar. Uh, somebody might say there's 15% difference. The numbers may be correct. I don't know. I'll do some research on that. But we don't ever see chimpanzees produce anything besides baby chimpanzees. None. It's not science. You can believe that if you want. And some people want to because they don't want God telling them what to do, I believe. But, and they certainly don't want a book telling them what to do. But there's no evidence anywhere of a chimpanzee producing a non-chimpanzee. If there are similarities, I bet there's thousands of lines of code that are similar between Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint. Thousands and thousands of identical lines of code. I bet if I'm typing a letter in Word and I go to spell check, it takes me to the same dictionary, thousands of millions of lines of code, than when I'm doing it in PowerPoint. That's because the same guy wrote the code. Duh, same guys. Okay, I think God wrote the code for the mice and the rats and the chimpanzees and the humans, and there may be some similarities. So what? It doesn't prove ancestry, it proves common designer. Why don't they get it? Go ahead. Appreciate it, Kent. Appreciate it as well, SWE, for your questions and super chats. James, go ahead if there's anything you wanted to add. Well, I mean, Ken admits that lions, tigers, house cats, bobcats, he admits they're the same kind. Why he's not so sure about rats and mice being the same kind. I think any two-year-old would look, if you put a mice, a rat, a muskrat, and a turtle, they would say, oh, the, the mouse and the rat are in the same kind. So by his definition, that's all we need to do is, like Nephilim Free, just bring a bunch of kids in and let them tell us what's in the same kind. But, uh, I mean, nobody doesn't believe anything because we don't want God telling us what to do. That's pretty silly. Uh, uh, I don't know who, who would go driving 100 miles an hour down the street pretending that there's no speed limit sign and being surprised when you get pulled over. It's really an asinine way of looking at things. I mean, who, who would read laws like uh, about, uh, you know, withholding Social Security and just say that doesn't apply to me? I mean... Uh, I mean, I don't know who would do that, but um, it's certainly not the way any rational person would uh, go about undertaking anything. If God was real and there was good reason to think he was, then we would take that into consideration. And uh, worshiping him, whether we thought he was a good guy, that would be a separate question. And he would have some questions to answer, but uh, wouldn't deny he's real or exists if there was good reason to think he was. All right. Thank you, James. This was the last question. It was for you, Kent. So we'll let you have a final word there. And then we're going to wrap it up, gentlemen. Great debate. Kent, go ahead. Yeah, I think I said all. I don't know that those numbers are correct, but even then it wouldn't prove the relationship. It could prove a common designer. Well done. Honda, Honda Accord and Honda Prelude and Honda Civic have a whole lot of similarities. They're all built by Honda. All right, Kent, James, that concludes the debate. Thank you both for your time. Thanks, and uh, any quick final words, thoughts from you gentlemen before we let you out for the night? We're having an after show on the Amy Newman channel. I think it's going to get started in about an hour. So Kent, I know you're probably going to head to bed, but uh, anybody else can uh, come over. Kent, you've got me. Uh, I was trying to ask some questions the other day on your channel, but I'm blocked on the uh Ken Hovind official, maybe you could have one of your tech guys go in there because I would never say anything that would uh, warrant being blocked. Uh, I don't know uh, who's blocked and who's not. I can barely uh, figure out how to set my time on my watch. Uh, so the tech <laughs> stuff is a little over my head. Uh, closing. The fool said in his heart, there's no God. James, this is you. Okay. Mm. Okay. The fool says there's no God. You can believe that if you want. If you died today, where would you go? James, I predict, I make a prediction, you'll die. I make a prediction, you'll be dead for a long time. Mm -hmm. I make a prediction, you will face God that you don't believe in, and you'll wish you would have listened to Kent Hovind. I make that prediction tonight. <laughs> Write that down. Okay? Thank you. All right, Kent, James, thank you so much. It's not testable, though. you got to wait till after you're dead to find out. All right, guys, we'll let you out. I, I usually stick around for a couple minutes, go over reminders, announcements. So, Thank gentlemen, you. thanks again for the debate, and we will see you later. All right, it's just me and the audience. Uh, there it is, round three between Kent Hoven and James W., 
Uh, you know, that flew by. That was two hours right there. Tons of fantastic questions. Doki Doki Bible Club. Uh, you know, thank you so much for all the uh, super stickers. You are the uh, super sticker master to anybody who sent in, uh, you know, just super chats with just comments, showing their love, super stickers. Thank you so much as, as well. You know, this is, uh, you know, you guys are the life and blood of this channel. So you guys are exactly why uh, we are able to um, you know, put out uh, full-time content. It's been the summer of debates. We've already had a couple debate marathons and I'm working on probably one more debate marathon for August. And uh, just the last couple nights I've spent, you know, hours and hours catching up on emails and requests. And I've now uh, booked debates into, um, I've booked debates into October. So we, we, we are packed with debates until probably, uh, you know, the, the rapture, as I like to to tease. So Talking Trees, Donnie, who made your logo, boss? Um, you know what? I, some logos uh, have been done by um, Benjamin, who, who's done a fantastic job. I've also gotten them done over uh, Fiverr. I think I'm saying that correctly. So anybody who's interested in, uh, you know, information on where I got some of my intros done, logos, just shoot me, shoot me an email. Um, so, okay, well, uh, let me go over a couple reminders then before I forget. So again, this Friday, the evolution debate challenge series continues Tom jump versus Dr. Dino. I think we've got about four or five so far scheduled for, um, for August. And I know, uh, Dr. Dino's 300th debate is coming up. So he's second, he's, he's setting records. So I think I've got him scheduled up to 299. So whoever wants to be debate number 300, uh, shoot me an email and we'll try and fit that into August. Uh, even though August is packed with debates, if it's debate number 300, we'll make it a special event that'll be a ton of fun. So whatever evolutionist wants to, uh, you know, uh, be privileged or who who wants to be that debate number 300, uh, you know, shoot me an email. Actually, you know, we, ho we hosted debate number 200. I think that was between Kent and uh, Jordan from reason to doubt if, if I'm not mistaken. So shoot me an email if you want to be debate number 300 and we'll do our best to set that up. Um, okay. We've also got, I believe this is Saturday night is the KJV, the only accurate English translation. So we've been doing a, um, a ton of debates on Bible translations as well. Uh, and they've been a ton of fun. Uh, over the last couple of nights, I've booked a couple more on that topic that I'm probably going to uh, fit into either late August or September. Um, I've also been doing a lot of work setting up our Defending Genesis Conference 2022 um, for September. So that's going to be uh, probably the first week of September. And I've already got, I think, about six or seven speakers so far. And it's probably going to be a week-long conference. So that week, I'm probably going to do my best to not schedule any debates. And I'm just going to strictly make that the conference. And it's going to be all things Genesis. We got some great speakers. And that is going to be, that's going to be a heavy week. That's going to be very comprehensive. So we've also got a couple soteriology-related debates coming up. Charles Jennings from the Layman Seminary and David Preston, both uh, fantastic debaters, well-studied, well-educated on, uh, you know, the world of soteriology. And they're going to be debating uh, faith alone or faith plus works in the Old Testament. So that's going to be a ton of fun. That's coming up on the 30th, uh, the 30th. Next month, we've got Matt Slick back here. Uh, he's going to be debating uh, Stanley Terry. Interesting topic. Was Jesus fully God and fully man during his earthly ministry? So I'm definitely uh, pumped for that one. Another uh, Bible translation debate, C.J. Cox and David Preston. And then we've also got C.J. Cox next month uh, debating Will Duffy on open theism. So we've uh, hosted and moderated over 200 debates now on all sorts of topics. And I believe that's going to be our first one on open theism. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that. From my understanding, uh, you know, Will Duffy is uh, one of the more well-known proponents of that theological position. And so that's going to be a ton of fun. Both Will and um, both Will and CJ are seasoned debaters. Put it that way. So it'll be one to remember. Talking Tree says, bro, these topics are lit. Well, I appreciate that. You know, we want to give you guys, uh, you know, as, as many debates as possible for the debate addict in you. Um, and, 
on all sorts of different topics. So again, you know, we, we've promoted this summer as the summer of debates and it really has been so far. So how are whales and pine trees related? Um, you know, the second uh, Daria Bloodworth uh, sent in, you know, the request for that debate uh, title and thesis, I thought definitely this is going to be awesome. So that one's coming up in a couple weeks as well. And um, I guess the last thing I'll mention, guys, this is just a snapshot of the overall material that uh, and content that we do have scheduled for the channel. So if you're not yet subscribed, please do hit that subscribe button. We just hit over 10,000 subscribers on the main channel. We've got over 20,000 on our secondary channel that we re-upload a lot of content on. That channel is called Young Earth Creation. So please do make sure to subscribe to that one if you're not yet subscribed to it. I've been doing an end times theology uh, series. I've done four episodes so far. And I'm currently working on the next several episodes that I hope to uh, record and post over the next several days. And in a week or two, we're going to have an open mic discussion. This is going to be a ton of fun. Ken Hovind's going to be here specifically uh, dealing with and focusing on eschatology, post-tribulation rapture versus pre-tribulation rapture. Ken's going to give a presentation. We'll have a little discussion. I'll uh, shoot the link into the chat and it'll be like a radio call-in show, uh, kind of similar to what we did a couple weeks ago. Uh, although it was probably more like a month ago, time flies by, uh, on the geologic column where we had a presentation, discussion, and then about an hour of just uh, open mic call-ins, you know, where you guys can, uh, you know, either agree or disagree and, you know, bring in your questions, objections, agreements, so on and so forth. So we're going to do that on the topic of eschatology which I think is going to be, uh, which is going to be really cool. So anyways, again, that's just a snapshot of the overall material that we do have, uh, you know, set and ready to go for, um, for the future. So if you're not yet subscribed, you know, hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you're a new subscriber, again, we've hosted and moderated over, uh, you know, uh, 200 debates on all sorts of topics. So check the, uh, check the playlist section titled Debates Hosted by Standing for Truth and uh, just go through that playlist. You've got endless content, endless debates. That's just the debates. You can also check or look, look into, you know, lectures and interviews hosted by Standing for Truth Ministries. And uh, we've done over 100 of those as well. So just looking at the chat, uh, no final questions or anything like that. So I think we're good. I think we're good. Oh, Talking Trees, new subscriber, just sub my man. My man, I appreciate that. Um, again, yeah, ch check the website, stanfortruthministries.com. I am working with my website designer on updating that because we've had so much content over the last several months that although there's a ton of content on the website, I, I want to get a lot of our content over the last few months up on the website as well. Update the homepage. I'm also working on, um, I'm working with, uh, brother Sam Jenkins from the uh, creation research team. And we are, uh, you know, trying to figure out we're in the brainstorming stages, but I want to get a podcast as well, a podcast section where, you know, weekly we upload, uh, you know, five, five of our previous debates in audio podcast form. And so eventually we'll have a podcast section where uh, we've got, uh, you know, all of our debates on there for people to look to look to look at if they prefer the podcast style. And um, I think that's it. Wade Robin says debates should be separate ancestry versus common ancestry. Well, you know what? I've myself, I've engaged in about 100 formal debates. Um, all mostly on uh, separate ancestry because that's the topic. You can see a couple behind me, uh, you know, uh, the independent origins handbook. I've literally written a book on it. So I do enjoy debating the separate ancestry uh, topic. I don't mind taking the affirmative. And so anybody who wants to either uh, join me on my uh, creation versus evolution conversation podcast that I've been doing, you know, shoot me an email. We'll set that up. I've got a couple of debates that I'm uh, currently working on in the future. Uh, one specifically on endogenous retroviruses. So I'll do my best to uh, fit in some of my own personal uh, debates as well. So, 
Um, SWE, I appreciate that. Good book. Even if you disagree, it's a good intro to the topic. Well, I appreciate that feedback, even if it's from, you know, critics, non-critics, those that agree with me, those that disagree with me, uh, you know, behind me, there is the, uh, the orange limited edition version that is still available for people. Uh, it was originally only going to be available for a week, but people were, you know, emailing me and letting me know that they really, really liked that cover. And so I thought, you know what, we'll keep it around for a while. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, shoot me an email if you're interested in uh, jumping into the debate octagon. If you want to debate the separate ancestry topic, shoot me an email. You know, I don't mind stepping in the ring as well. I'd like to, um, you know, I got to keep up with Kent as well. He's going on debate number 300. I'm on about 100. So, um, okay, well, that's that's pretty much it. I'm going to go have some coffee and some food and relax for a bit. Looks like there's a... There's a uh, an after show over on Amy Newman's channel, so check that out. Amy Newman, I believe, is going to be debating Kent as well, uh, either next month or September. So lots to look forward to, lots of fun. Uh, Suffer Me Not Radio, appreciate it. And again, to anybody whose question I didn't get to, I really do apologize. Uh, you know, once we hit the two-hour mark in terms of these uh, evolution debates. It's, I've really got no choice. We got to wrap it up at that point. So, uh, and you know, these debates really fly by. They're a ton of fun. Uh, I love the, you know, the discussion portion. Uh, I see Mark Reed in the chat. If you haven't seen uh, Mark Reed and Kent's debate from last week, that one was, that one was awesome. That one was a ton of fun too. So do please check it out. And again, if you're not yet uh, subscribed, hit that subscribe button and we will see you all. Uh, we'll have, I believe, our next soteriology panel debate or discussion. I believe we're either going to have that Wednesday or Thursday. It depends. Tomorrow night, uh, I'm going to be having Professor David McQueen and George Bond from Standing for Truth Ministries. They're going to be here and uh, they're going to be going over their um, research on the heat problem. So they did a heat problem uh, show, I believe, maybe four or five months ago. Professor David McQueen had a debate with Luca Medugno. Who, Luke, I do want to thank you in the chat. He's got uh, several debates coming up, one against T-Rock, one against Ken Hoven, one against myself, and then an, an eventual round two with Professor McQueen on the heat problem. Uh, and tomorrow is kind of uh, like a preliminary show where George and uh, David are going to be going over a lot of the research that, that they've done. You know, they've been working full time on that specific. Uh, topic. So Andrew Kaufman says Dwayne Gish had 700. Wow. If he had more than 700, I don't know. I don't think that's, that's a tough one to beat. That's for sure. <laughs> Andrew Kaufman, appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, to, to all the channel members, new subscribers, and, uh, you know, everybody that tuned in for, uh, tonight's important and epic debate. It was end game by the way. So what I'll do is um, as we typically do with these debate trilogies, Matt and myself will clip all three together. So we'll have the James W versus the Dr. Dino complete debate trilogy. And what we'll do is, uh, you know, put it up on the on the channel and and premiere it. The last one we did was Wade the Wizard versus Kent Hovind debate trilogy. And that one's been getting a ton of views and good feedback. So, all righty, that's, uh, that's about it. We're actually going to wrap it up now. And thanks again for tuning in. God bless. And we'll see you this week. We've got a few shows. Stand for Truth is out. Thank you.